way I grew up as a child, I grew up in real poverty, and I had so much passion for girls. So when I qualified, actually, when I went to teach in that village, my first impression was, I don't want to be here. Um, you know, when you qualify, you, you, you have passed, you want to, the schools in Zimbabwe are different. You can either be in a government school, you can be in a council school, or you can be in a private school. So if you're put in a council school, it's really like one of the bad ones where goats come in the class, the wind, no windows, and that's the school I was sent to. And I was like, why me? So, however, I even went to the regional office to complain that I don't want to be in this school. And, um, but they said, okay, why don't you just teach for a term and then we'll see if we can transfer you to another school because I wanted to be close to the city. So I went to this school and it was a totally, it changed my image because I thought my village was very poor. But when I started teaching that area, I realized that actually there are so different levels of poverty. So um, by the end of the term, I decided I was going to leave. So I started working with getting into the community, knowing the mothers, the parents. So I realized that in this village, it was most of the families were headed by women. And most of the men had go to the city or go to South Africa, but most of them don't come back. And um, I also realized within my classes, I was in a secondary school, a lot of the girls were quite older, but because the school was located by the border, there was a lot of girl trafficking. So we, we had high dropouts of girls. So I tried to investigate why did we have this high uh, girl dropout. It was because there were so many teenage pregnancies, and these girls, they get pregnant, but no husband because most of these pregnancies were by truck drivers. So the girls would be taken to Malawi, or some of them didn't come back to the village, disappear, or they come back pregnant. So we had lots of children in the village looked at by women. So I decided, and also because of the culture, it was such that the girl child, most of the girls were not in school. We had boys because the boy was regarded highly so I started working with women, trying to change minds, like we want girls in the school. And that's when I started introducing a project of making arts and crafts, making batiks, and during half-term holidays, I would go to South Africa, Botswana, trying to sell, bring money for these women so they can educate their girl child. It was during this uh, episodes where I was selling, buying and selling, there was solar eclipse in 1999, I walked 64 kilometers carrying a bag of uh, batiks that we'd made with women uh, to this place where people had come for rainbow gathering. They're called the Rainbow Family. And I was selling my batiks there. It was my, because in Zimbabwe, the situation is such that in the villages, you don't get tourists, especially where I was teaching, there's nothing for tourists. There's nothing for tourists. So it was my opportunity to actually see people from UK, to see, because we didn't know anything about the whole, even as a teacher. So I made friends there, and it happened that one of the people was there was from Carmarthen, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I don't think she realized what she was putting herself into. Um, but then I invited them to come to my school. I wanted them to visit my school. So luckily, I had a uh, lift back, back home. <laughs> but it was that time before elections in the year 2000. I didn't think, did I? Because at that point, there was this issue about white farmers, the farms being taken, and me, I'm bringing these white people in my school. Who do you think you are? The next thing I realized, I was beaten up. I was, uh, had people coming to my class because I was teaching geography. And it was also towards the end, revision classes. And we were talking about the economy of the, con the country. The economy was going down. So I taught a session about what are the reasons? Why is the economy going down? And one of the reasons, because obviously, why farmers have been thrown out of the country. So I touched the hotspot of my ex-president Mugabe, 
So I ended up in prison, and uh, the last thing my children saw me, I was on the floor bleeding, and they thought I was dead. So I communicated with my friend in Wales, and I said, my life is in danger, I don't know what to do. I went to police, and they said, you put yourself, you put your foot in this, so we're not helping you. My friend said, Martha, you've got to come to Wales. I said, what about my children? She said, what can we do? I can only afford to bring you to Wales, but I can't afford your children. So I left my, my son was 12 years old. My young one was nine years old. That's how I came to Wales. Yes, and Wales has been blessed by having This is my home. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you came and you made this your home. Yeah. And how and when did you start Love Zimbabwe? So I came to Wales as a visitor to this place and who lives in Carmarthen. And uh, I kept listening what was happening in Zimbabwe and definitely I decided I'm not going back. So I said to my friend, what else can I do? I, I want to stay. So she said, well, I've got an Irish friend in London. Do you think it's a good idea to go to London and study? I said, yeah, I will. So I went to London. Can I ask for a tissue, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said I'd give you tissues, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so for me, because I, I was not allowed to work here, I was a visitor, it was impossible. But with my friend, because she really liked our arts and crafts when I went to see her in, uh, when she was in Zimbabwe. So we decided we we're going to create a women's circle. It was nothing, because at that point I was so angry, I just divorced with my ex-husband and it was not, that's the issue in Africa. Women, we suffer, we struggle with the children. So even me as a teacher, my husband was not giving me support. So I said to my friends in Wales, why don't we start a women's circle? And this women's circle is about selling. We want to sell our products. So when I came to Wales, I came with a suitcase full of arts and crafts. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so my friend lived in a barn on a farm. And the farm was so made in a nice way. Uh, it was so nice and warm. I came on the 27th of January. And she had an oven, and it was so nice and warm. But guess what? After midnight, the whole barn caught fire. We lost everything apart from, we still got the baskets. Because we have been looking at these arts and crafts, we were all like, yes, we're going to sell, we're going to do this market. She was organizing. And that was the beginning of the life. So I started volunteering because I couldn't work, going into schools, just talking about girl child, because that was my passion, talking about girl child, the difficulties about women, and doing sales in schools. But towards the end of my visa, I said to my friend, I'm not going back to Zimbabwe, but I don't want to claim for asylum because I can't not see my children. So I went to London and I stayed with this girl, an Irish person, because I didn't know anyone in UK from Africa. I didn't know any person that I could communicate with. So this Irish girl took me in and <clears throat> I became an au pair in London. So weekends, I was going to the market. I was doing markets and then I met this gentleman sitting there at the market with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we became friends and before you know it, I've got no papers. I need to live in UK, but I can't live in UK. I was about to go back home, and Dave was like, I want to come with you to Zimbabwe. So Dave came to Zimbabwe with me in 2004, and that time, when I was working as an au pair, all the money I was earning, which was not in a, a lot, but I helped my father to extend the house so my children could stay with him. So when I took David in 2004, the house had been destroyed. That's when Mugabe introduced the clearing thing. So I got there, it was raining, my children had nowhere to stay, all the property furniture was outside. And I remember David said to me, how did you come out of this? And I think those words have kept me strong, like, who am I? So that's when we came with the name Love Zimbabwe. The work that we are doing is for the love of the people who've got no voice. And you're caught up in a situation. <laughs> <laughs> you're caught up in a situation where 
your hands are tied. And I think for the people that we work with, trade has been the most important part of our lives that has kept us going and that has kept us together. So me and David decided to work together and I think that's where we fell in love, actually. <laughs> and we decided to get married. So we got married in Zimbabwe, but I couldn't come back. They wouldn't let me in. So I stayed in Zimbabwe for another three months whilst David was sorting out my papers here. He had to prove that we had lived together and all these sorts of our visa. So I think for me, it's just like the importance of knowing the background, where we come from. It's nice now that I'm, I'm living in Wales, everything is happy. But if you had asked me like 20 years ago, there's no way I would have thought one day I'll be sitting in front of this crowd speaking English <laughs> <laughs> and sharing my life story because we are born in these backgrounds which are tough. I was talking to one of the... Sorry, I didn't ask your name. One of the ladies outside who has also happened to have parents who are in Zimbabwe and they've moved out because of the difficulties. If you can manage to move out, it's okay. But what if you can't move out? What if you've got no job? What if you've got a child, especially a child who is disabled? So with Love Zimbabwe, we introduced a community center at the community center, my passion is about children living with disabilities, especially girls and disabled children, because the stigma still exists. I lost a child. My child died of meningitis. I was told my child would have been mentally disabled. It was so hard. My child only lived four months, but those four months were tough. Even I was a teacher, but I couldn't handle it. The situation was very difficult. So we decided at the community center that we want to remove the this, this stigma about a disabled child. A lot of disabled child are hidden in the homes. So we established this community center that the mothers will make arts and crafts whilst the children are there as well, enjoying playing. So we have built this community center with the library, with education facilities. Luckily, we live in Wales. Through Hub Community Africa, we have been funded our community center has got clean water, we've got boreholes, we've got, um, through WCVA as well, we, we got funding the grants. So we, we, we have managed, and through selling as well, we've got so many shops in Wales. I can mention Fair Ideas, I can mention Fair and Fabulous. They've taken us in and sold our stuff, which is really, because it's been a journey, and I remember, when I brought my son, she came to Fair and Fab he came to Fair and Fabulous to see our products. It made him feel so much better that our products are being well received here in Wales. So we go back to Wales every year, once every year, to look after these children, but to make sure to try and mobilize the government to make sure that there are facilities for children with disabled children, children with disabilities to go into schools, which is really tough at the moment. Sorry. No, no, I don't, don't so apologize. You're fine. I haven't started kicking you. It's fine. <laughs> so, um, some people accuse us of being prepared to do crazy things to raise awareness about fair trade. Would you like to describe what's happening in this picture? Of us? I think the person behind me, can I, can I be cheeky to get you to just stand up, please? <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I only realized a month before this that I was pregnant. <laughs> so this is on the canal path between yeah. Upper and Brecon. What month of the year? <laughs> It was on the 12th of December. If you look at the ground, you might notice the frost. <laughs> <laughs> and you determined to do that barefoot, didn't you? <laughs> and Jill's role was to go behind <coughs> with goose fat to put on your feet. <laughs> we did well, Jill, didn't we? <laughs> we did well, we did well. That's what friendship is about. It's about sharing the struggles. It's not easy. We've been on a journey together, and we realize what we are doing. And when you suffer, when you realize that this is pain, 
you actually love what you're doing because you realize that I'm not just doing this, but I'm doing for a reason. And this was raising awareness about women who walk miles, distances, carrying firewood, carrying their babies with no shoes. And we look into our wardrobes, how many pairs of shoes have we got? And we even like buy designer shoes, it costs a lot of money. But so someone there has got nothing, they've got nothing, so that was raising awareness. But also because to set up our charity, we were told that we needed to have like an income of 5,000 pounds. And I was thinking, how am I going to have 5,000 pounds? I haven't got it, I haven't got a job or anything. So the only way I can do it is just to walk barefoot. Which worked, we raised 2,500 pounds. <laughs> so that, that really raised a good awareness. And again, we were raising awareness about the importance of trade to women in Africa as well. So thank you so much for bringing <laughs> that. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> so you talk about struggle, and struggle continues. So um, in the events following Black Lives Matter, you were very involved in the protests in Abergavenny. How was that? Was it well received? Was there a backlash to it? Um, actually, I, I am black, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes you leave, you leave, but you don't, you think you're living in a community where people love you, you're walking, you think you're free, you're safe. Until when Black Lives Matters came through, I realized how much a community is disintegrated that I live in. There were moments that I felt really angry. I felt really upset because the Black Lives Matters, they brought a debate which, was, which is true, the communities we are living in, we are still suffering, racism still exists, but people are living in denial. So there are some people who still think, we don't want black people in this country, we don't. And I remember there was a Focus magazine, they took in my, when I did this speech, the talk, they, they put the story in the Focus magazine and one of the business people said, because you've put black matters in this focus magazine, I don't want it in my shop anymore. How do you feel? We need to challenge these issues. This is why we are together as a family. Color shouldn't exist among us. We are one people. It's about humanity. But uh, black lives matters. And also, it was not, I think people didn't get the message. What was the message behind Black Matters? Black, Black Lives Matters. People didn't get the message correct, so they misconstrued the whole aspect of it, and that is what worried me. But deep inside, I'm really happy because it was a very powerful debate, and it actually, it actually brought changes in our in our communities. Yeah, sometimes you have to rip the plaster off a wound for it to heal, don't Certainly. you? Yeah. Definitely. You've yeah. got to be in the mud to feel good. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, have I missed gone to again? So, the pandemic, obviously, another <laughs> struggle we've all had. How have the community you work with survived? What effect has that had? Um, like everything else, Pandemics, pandemics. So Zimbabwe is suffering. We've got our political crisis. We've got climate change. A lot of people have suffered not knowing when to plant, not knowing what to grow, because the whole season aspect has changed. And then this pandemic coming, everyone is saying this is a curse from God. We have no idea what is happening. And no one would want to know about it because the suffering is too much. Our community, our society, we are community-based. We want to see each other, we want to be together. We eat with our hands and we eat in the same plate. So when this came, it was like a nightmare. It took ages. So we, as Love Zimbabwe, we realized, especially for me, I've got my children there. The last thing I wanted to hear is one of my child has died and I can't go. So we said, what can we do? So we took a campaign to raise awareness. We raised awareness by going into schools. We had a team of 15 people who went into schools to start, start from them when they're young, because young children change minds when they go home. Talk to them what it is about. Show them the reality of what it is happening, what's happening. 
So we were very lucky. We applied for funding, and we managed to get a grant from the Welsh government. I'll tell you, come to Wales. <laughs> we are very <laughs> lucky we live in Wales. So we got funding, and our funding was to work in school, raising awareness, but also educating people about washing hands, and also giving soap and sanitizer to people. So when <clears throat> this idea came, when people actually understood, so we also got an idea of making tippy taps. Those are tippy taps. It was very well received because everyone had knowledge of who, how it started. I think it's about when you don't know what is this about. So we had to educate them and everyone, and even now, people are now self-motivated that they just do their tippeters. You find tippeters even by the shops, but it was an idea that we introduced that at the gate of each homestead, they have a tippeter. When they come in, they wash their hands, and it has worked really well. So we are very grateful. Fantastic. So you have achieved so much. I started writing a list, and I ran out of... <laughs> of space. I thought I would take the rest of the day. So this is you in the Senate <laughs> as one of a hundred, what, hundred Welsh women who were being honoured for their contribution <laughs> to society. You have done a lot of research, haven't you? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you keep wanting me to cry. <laughs> and there's your awards at festivals. And would you like to say something about the twin town with Abergavenny? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm the wrong person to be here. <laughs> I just, just want to cry. <laughs> Do you know how it feels when you realise your community has accepted you as one of them? It makes a huge change, especially knowing that this town comes, I wasn't there when the elections were done. David went to the meeting, I couldn't face it because I didn't know what the outcome was. And I tell you what, I had a bottle of champagne waiting <laughs> and they agreed, the Upper Governing Town Council agreed that the town be linked with my village. So it's amazing news. And we had to do an inauguration. So if you walk in the library in Abagaveni, there is this statue here. And this statue is called Zimbabwe. It, it's, a, it's, it's got a story about the struggles, what has happened. You know, when I say I grew up in a village, when, um, what's it called? When white people went to Zimbabwe, they scrambled for Africa, they had the rich lands. And people in Zimbabwe had poor lands. So, I grew up in the land that is called tribal, they're called tribal trust lands. Uh, so because of colonization, it has been difficult for black people to climb up the ladder. So this statue is a statue about communities, the struggle that the Shona people have had, but how to come out of those communities, out of those struggles. So the, the town council of Abagaveni agreed that we want this to be in our library so all children can be educated about these struggles that other people go through. But the aspect of fair trade was in that we share through art and because we sell arts and crafts. But there is so much story behind craft. There's so much story behind making an artifact that has got history. The artist of this uh, statue he lives in Abagaveni, but he lived in Africa, in Botswana. So his understanding of the Shona culture made him think that he wanted to do something for Zimbabwe, which also touched me. So through these links, we have managed now, and we have had support from the British Council. We have linked schools, four schools in Wales, with four schools in Zimbabwe. And this has really helped a lot, because what we wanted is to highlight for the children in Africa to understand issues, to know what children here go through. So this has been a really good collaboration, sharing. And again, through WCVA, we were funded to get computers at the community center, and this has increased in our digital collaboration. So we now have children who have never had access to a computer. They come to our library, but I go into schools, we have a link up so the children can share 
and know, learn about what is fair trade, what is it, what we're talking about, how can you come out of poverty by making you, so it gives them inspiration instead of, so when we grew up, our education was just focused academically, oh, you've got to do English, go to pass math, go to, but some of us, we are not good at mathematics. So if we encourage skills, essential skills, very important in our lives, get our learners to like what they make, and then here as well, <clears throat> our children will appreciate why are we talking about fair trade? It's because we are helping someone to come out of poverty. Someone who might not be academically intelligent, but they are skilled, they can make these beautiful arts and crafts. So that's what we're doing with the communities. So what next? What more would you like to do? Well, I've been listening to the other speakers and I was so touched by the previous speakers about communities. And it's all about sustainability, because we want the communities to be sustainable and to overcome, because climate change has caused so much suffering. It's a pandemic in its own self. So <clears throat> we want to maintain, we want to increase the work that we're doing at the community center. Like now, we are at a situation where we've been stuck because we haven't been able to trade, going out, that, because that's how people are surviving. So what we want to do is to increase their economic, their incomes by keeping selling the asynchronous. Sorry, I've got to look at my notes now. <laughs> so because of climate change, sustainability in the community, at the community center needs to keep going. We need to educate people about organic crop production because what has happened within the years, people have been Oh, what is it called, to use fertilizers. So we've destroyed our soils, our soils have become loose, we've got no trees because people use trees for firewood, we've got no electricity, but that has caused deforestation. So we are now educating people how to grow trees. We have introduced, um, a, a, we, we learned this from other organizations, Sendekau, about um, Kiwo Gardens. So we've been educating mothers how to make a Kiwo Garden, but in a permaculture style. So we have uh, trained our commission to manage to, manager to learn about organic crop production so we can restore the soils. So this is what we want to do. And also, we have introduced a project because it's not easy as a charity raising money. It's hard. Doing the grants for funding, it's hard. And some of them are prescribed as well. We want to be free. So the other way we can raise money is by introducing, because like I say, coming to UK has changed me as a person. I want other people in Zimbabwe as well to understand what it is about living in a developed country. But they can only understand it when they make friendships. So we've introduced cultural exchange trips. So we take students from UK to go and stay in our community center. And when they stay there, it's about creating this kind of understanding, this friendship that they bring back here. And also, we would like to try to bring students from Zimbabwe as well to come here. So this is a project that we have introduced. We started in 2009 with Lampeter University. And it has really helped because young people, when they see reality, we talk about poverty here. But when you go and see poverty in Africa, it really changes your mindset. One of my trustees <clears throat> came to Zimbabwe. She had never been to Africa before, but she went back three times. And she ended up doing a project on women, on the power of light. How can someone live with just a candle? How can someone live with just a matchstick? Matchstick is life for a woman in Africa. But here we've got switches, we've got everything. So she did a comparison and it was huge what she found out. So this is what we want to do. And also, the most important thing is we want our producers, we don't want to let them down. That connection with producers in Zimbabwe during these challenging times, because that person was making that daffodil, that daffodil has to be sold, and it's gotta be sold in Wales. And it's us who can market that daffodil. Thank you. <laughs> well, just amazing to hear from you. And I just wanted to let you know, sort of going full circle, that this term, my daughter learned about you in school as part of the Welsh curriculum. <laughs> Thank you. She keeps wanting to 
make me cry every time I Does don't anyone know. have any questions or tissues or <laughs> <laughs> makeup remover? Not, anyone's not crying. <laughs> and has a question. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get some steps in. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Len Sheena, so you. much. We've got sort of five minutes or so. I, th I think You've never come in under time, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> that is an absolute first. <laughs> yeah. Just a simple question. Um, just wondering. So, where are your kids? I didn't quite catch. Where are your children? Are are they are they in Zimbabwe or are they here? They're still in Zimbabwe. It's not easy. It's a journey, but um, I'm hoping one day. But they're no longer kids now. <laughs> I've got grandchildren. I've got uh, three grandchildren, and my first son is 30, 34. So they are now helping me managing the community center. So I think this whole thing has kept us together because it's not easy for me. You know how it is with the visa situation and you have to guarantee you've got enough money or bank account. I haven't got the money. So I couldn't bring my children to be with me and because I didn't become an asylum seeker as well. So a lot of my friends who came and claimed asylum ship, they all left their children here, but I didn't. But then because of my community spirits, I'm happy the way things are because it's giving my children a purpose. It's giving them a purpose to be there and also to get the community engaged. The, the way things are happening, I think it was meant to be. So they are still in Zimbabwe. And that's why we go every year. Oh, that's Thank amazing. You. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. I'm coming in this way. <laughs> Drive by. Hi, amazing story, uh, courage in the face of adversity and truly inspiration. Most of us can't even think about any of these things that you've gone through. Um, so obviously your work is still continuing in Zimbabwe. Um, things have changed, the government has changed, but it, obviously it's not um, normal, I think, still there. What kind of um, difficulties do you still face working there um, in, with, with the people in Zimbabwe? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how much people know about Zimbabwe at the moment because um, we have struggled, we have suffered with a line of dictators in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe has got no money. Our economy has frozen. We have got no money at all. So we are using American dollars. It is so hard when someone is so desperate, they've got no money, they're trying, they've got no bank accounts. Bank accounts don't exist. So people, <clears throat> most of the people do, is it called, uh, when you swap butter markets, yeah, that's what they do. So it is hard as well because me, when I got there, I want to be part of the community, but because I live in the UK and because I'm married to a white person, when I get there, they think I'm rich. So you find that it's so difficult to get that understanding that I'm still the same as you. And them to understand that I still struggle to get the things sold. So sometimes I get there and the prices are like, <laughs> so you have to do research, like what is, what is the right price? What should, how can I help? So you see, we're trying to, it's not like them, it's us. We're helping each other, but it's impossible because of the suffering. And I can understand because everyone is really struggling. So people have got no money, people have got no food, people want to pay for school fees. So any opportunity that arises, yeah, that's the problem that we're having at the moment. And now, fuel prices have gone up. Everything has escalated. Bringing arts and crafts from Zimbabwe is now very difficult. It's very expensive. So, and then here, if we put the prices up, you guys are not gonna buy our stuff. So where do we, what, what do we do? We don't know. It's not easy, it's really hard, thank you. Joanna, where are we time-wise? <laughs> One final question, if anybody's got anything quick. No? Okay. Martha, thank you so much. I know you're with us um, till the end of the day. You're here till... 
Yes, I think we'll be here until, oh, I'm very jealous you guys are going to have drinks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I can't stay because I'm now, for the first time since I came